Well, this morning, church, I'm pretty sure this is the first time we've heard him as a congregation. I know he's preached a few times at youth, but we have the absolute honour of being able to hear from our youth pastor. So I'd ask you all in, here in the hall, up at Neil, let's stand as we welcome Pastor Caleb to share the word this morning. Good morning, good morning. Oh, I'm loud. I'm very loud. That's awesome, though. Hey, everyone can take your seat. Thank you, amazing worship team. Everyone give a, a round of applause to the worship team for just nice resolve there. Well done, Chris. Love your work, mate. It's good. How good to be here this morning. How are we all doing? We're feeling Christmassy. We're feeling happy to be in the house of God. Awesome. Oh, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. It's such an honor and privilege to be able to come up here and share the word as I struggle and wrestle with my iPad, as usual. I totally get the struggle as well, Nathan. You know, when you've got 15 cards in your hand, it's just not practical to try and flip between them, and it just doesn't work. Um, probably easiest to use your phone, but you know, we don't do that here because we're, we have a spirit of excellence. Um, <laughs> awesome, awesome. Hey, um, yeah, once again, thank you guys so much for having me up here this morning. I'm very excited to bring a bit of a word uh, this morning that uh, I've been stewing on for quite a while, and it's something that I hope can bring a lot of encouragement to you, but also be aware that it is very much a youth pastor on the loose up here. So <laughs> I don't have any stories about any rollerblading accidents this time around, um, which I know is probably going to devastate a few of you, and I might see some people walk out. But hey, who knows? Pastor Andrew and Rachel are not here, so... Um, <laughs> We'll see how it goes, hey? <laughs> awesome. Um, and I just, I just thought I'd quickly touch on, it's a very special morning uh, for me this morning because we have some amazing guests with us. We have um, Alicia's amazing mum and brother, um, Fiona and Harley, who are here with us. Make them feel welcome. And hey, come up and say hello after the service because they're lovely people and uh, just make them feel welcome and yeah, it'll be great. Awesome. But hey, since Pastor Andrew and Rachel are not here. I thought it'd be a great excuse for me to be able to piggyback off something that they already had said, and they wouldn't know that I've done it. Ha <laughs> ha. But um, we've been recently going through a series with Pastor Andrew talking about landmarks of the faith, and we've been reading out of Jeremiah uh, uh, chapter 6, verses 16, where it tells us to look for the ancient paths where the way is good so that we may walk in them. Essentially this, why learn the hard way from our own mistakes when we can learn through the wisdom of God through the accounts of others. And these paths help us build our lives in a way that honors God and bring glory to his name. So today I want to share a bit of a testimony relating to one of these landmarks that we've been speaking about recently, something that happened in my own life and the fruit that I saw come from it. So we're going back to the landmark of the practice of the presence. So uh, just a quick recap, because Pastor Andrew spoke about this a few weeks ago, but just to, to get it fresh in our brains, practicing the presence is simply making intentional time and space to enter the presence of God. There are ways that, many ways we can do this through prayer, through fasting, through worship, through quiet contemplation, through reflection. Sometimes we just need to sit down and be quiet and just actually say, God, speak to me. And this is a way, these are all ways that we can actually draw close to God so that we can know him. We see these landmarks, they all serve a purpose, right? They, they bring so much more than just to bring blessing into our own lives. The thing is they do. God is good and God blesses his people and God cares for us and loves us, but he blesses us so that we may bring blessing to others and bear witness to the goodness of God. They equip us to witness, to, to minister and to move in the power of the Spirit. And this morning, I want to share a bit about a way in my life in which the practice of presence outworked itself and uh, it changed the scenario that I was in. Uh, in a message that I very confusingly titled, Practically Practicing the Presence. <laughs> I thought that was good. But it, I feel like if you name things strange names, it makes people remember them. You don't remember the concise title, but you remember the one that doesn't make very much sense. Practically Practicing the Presence. Bit of a tongue twister. You see, I believe there are two parts to the practice of the presence. There's the first one. We practice the presence, of course, to know God, to draw close to him, to hear his voice. But then we are called to go and make that presence known. It's like what we have written in the foyer. Know God, make him known. And I've seen the fruit in my life that God has produced uh, through this principle. But before we get into any of my story, I think it's best that we jump into the word first. Hey, because let's look at that ancient pathway that God has laid out for us 
so that we can draw wisdom from it and we can learn from an account that's probably a lot better than anything that I've ever done in my life, right? <laughs> so uh, we're going to be jumping into the, the story of Daniel uh, so we can learn from an example that he set for us so we can be empowered by the Holy Spirit to, be, to begin to outwork the will of God in the world. But first, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this morning. I thank you that we can come together as a church and just gather in your name, Lord. We pray that as we read your word, Lord, you speak to us, you challenge us, you convict us, you bring encouragement, Lord, so that we can be equipped, Lord, to serve you. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. So, we're going to be opening up our Bibles. If, who's got a Bible here? I asked this question at youth, so I'm going to ask it here. Get out your Bibles. We're going to the book of Daniel, and we're going to be reading from chapter 1, verse 1, right off the bat. And we're going to get into it, and this is going to provide a bit of context into the world in which Daniel was entering. Reading from verse 1, it says, During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign, really sorry, there's a lot of funky names in this bit, but that's just kind of how it is in the Old Testament. Uh, the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar, another great name, of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Not good, right? This uh, king of Babylon had come and basically besieged the city of Jerusalem and actually had the, uh, the, the Israelites in captivity, right? And, and he began to take the treasures of the storehouse of our God and put it in the, treasure, uh, in the storehouse of his own God, right? The thing is, God was permitting this to happen. God, God is... It can only happen under the will of God, but still, it's not a great time for the kingdom, right? And then, then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. And then it says in verse 6, Daniel, Hananiah, Mizael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. What a gross situation to be in, right? Can you imagine how it would have felt to be someone like Daniel where your people had just been oppressed and then to be picked up, taken to the palace of the very people who were oppressing you and saying, you know what, we're also going to train you in our ways so you can join the palace to the very people who are oppressing your people. That's a bad situation, right? Not only have your people been overthrown, but now you're being pulled into the giant, I guess, machine of the very people who are oppressing your people. If I was Daniel, I'd be, I would have been like, what, what is going on, God? What is happening here? Why am I here? What is going on? And I find that we as Christians often find ourselves in scenarios like this, don't we? We find ourselves placed in situations that we don't want to be in. We can't see why we're meant to be there or why things are working out the way that they are. Maybe for you it might be a workplace situation, right? You're stuck in a job that you don't like, that you, you feel like your talents and your energy and your resources are wasted. Or maybe there's people that are difficult to work with, there's little grace, there's little patience, and it's just a toxic environment. And you find yourself asking, God, why is it like this? Why am I here? What's the point? I could be better off doing something somewhere else. Why have you got me here? Maybe it's issues in family life. Maybe tension in the family. We all know that sometimes there can be a lot of friction between people and a family. Maybe you're the only believer in your household or your family and it draws a lot of heat to you because people don't understand. Or vice versa, someone that you know, a brother, a sister, an auntie, a cousin, a niece, a nephew, whoever has unfortunately sadly walked away from the Lord due to hurt or pain or frustration or maybe even anger at the church. And you find yourself being the target of their hostility. And you find yourself in the middle of this thing where you're kind of almost like you're trying to play a mediator in this situation. And you're like, God, why? Why is it like this? What is happening here? Or maybe if you're a young person, it's at school. You don't like your classes. You don't like your teachers. You're like, God, I don't want to be here. I'm so done with this. I, I don't care about fractions and whatnot. Get me out of here. I want to be out doing good things, right? Maybe it's your circle of friends and you're finding them starting to drift away and 
head in directions that you're not really sure of and you're kind of caught in this place where you love God but the people around you are doing the wrong thing and you're kind of in this middle place and you're like, why can't they just do the right thing? Why can't people just be good people, right? And we get frustrated and we get mad because things don't work out the way that we want to and we don't understand why. And for me, I found myself in this predicament a few years ago. Um, A lot of you probably know this, but some of you may not know this, but before Alicia and I moved to the wonderful land of Horsham and got to be with all of you lovely people, um, back in Melbourne, I was working as a mechanic. I was still um, involved in the church, looking after young adults and youth and doing all those wonderful things, but my day job during the week is I was a mechanic. Um, And the way I sort of landed up in that situation is I I, I sort of had a, I knew I had a call on my life for ministry, and straight out of school, God began to lead me on this journey, and I began to pursue things and do Bible college and all of those things like that. But the doors just weren't opening at the time. And I know now because it was, I was immature, I was inexperienced, I needed to get some things under my belt, you know. But I figured there's no use sitting around and twiddling my thumbs and waiting for something to happen. I need to make myself useful. <laughs> so I thought, Paul was a tent maker. So maybe I should pick up a trade of some sort. And I kind of like cars. So I'm like, yeah, mechanic is good. And this is where I found myself in this career, locked in for four years as an apprentice. This is where, unfortunately, though, I entered a completely hostile environment. Anybody who's worked in the automotive trade before knows that workshops can be a pretty toxic environment. Who I feel like I feel like Guy might know this. I feel like Jono might know this. He might have seen that, right? You see, the workshop that I was in particular was a place that almost prided itself on being opposed to God. The culture was so far removed from what is good, it, it was actually frightening. It was full of very unfortunately broken, hurt, angry people who took that anger and frustration out on other people, on each other, on the management, their tools, the apprentices, which unfortunately who was me in this case, and even the customers. It was just shocking. You know, many of my co-workers were engaged in these extreme sinful lifestyles and they were so proud of it. They would boast about their substance abuse issues and, and their binge drinking and gambling and violence and, and they were so proud of it. And they're like, yeah, we're awesome. We're sick. Yeah, this is the best thing ever. And I was like, who are these people? Why are you like this? And I'm like, I was so green. I just come out of church world and thrust right into the... Anyway, it was, it was crazy. That would be incredibly degrading to, to women and they listened to this disgusting music and they would watch explicit content at work and they loved sin. And the sad thing is their life bared the fruit of that love for sin. Broken relationships, addictions, financial issues, and anger issues. I unfortunately copped a lot of heat as well because they knew off the bat that I was a Christian. Because I told them. (laughs) We should tell people we're Christians. We shouldn't be hiding that, right? So off the bat, I'm not saying, oh, look at me, but off the bat, they knew that. I didn't want to live the way that they were living and they took that as an attack on their way of living. Uh, they actually made it their game that they're like, you know what? We're going to try and break this guy. And that's not figuratively. They literally came and said that to my face. They're like, we are going to muck you up. We are going to corrupt you. We are going to get in your head. They would purposely try and set me off. They would play their music that was really offensive and gross, really loud, especially when the customers would hear it. And it was so embarrassing. I'm like, oh, I don't want to be associated with these guys. They would try and shove uh, filthy videos in my face and they'd try and get a rise out of me. One of their favorite games is they like to try and make me swear because they thought it was really funny that I didn't swear as a mechanic, but it just slowly escalated over time. And uh, it it got to the culmination at one point where my manager set me on fire (laughs) to try and get me to swear. He came up behind me, sprayed my shoes and my legs with brake cleaner and actually lit me up. (laughs) That is like the level of mechanic jokes, by the way. It's just assault with laughing in the background. (laughs) Like, it was crazy. And I was miserable. And this time of my life was, especially that first year, I just spent all my time whinging to God. Why am I here? God, why have you done this? I thought we're going to go and save the world and do missions and all these things. Why am I stuck in this workshop with these people who hate me and hate you? Right? And we all have stories like this sometimes, don't we? And I know in this room there'll be a lot of people who have stories that are far worse than mine. And they've been through a lot more or are currently going through a lot worse than anything I've ever gone through. But as believers and ambassadors for the kingdom of God... We will face these scenarios because we are called to go and make disciples. We are called to go and make the presence of God known. And for that to happen, we need to go into places where he's unknown. 
And as we learned through that, the scripture we just read, Daniel was thrust into a very difficult circumstance, and yet God moved in power through Daniel and used him to bring transformation into the palace and the kingdom. How did he do that? What was different about Daniel? You see, Daniel was a man who knew how to get into the presence of God. In Daniel chapter 6, verses 10, it says, But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down, as usual, in his upstairs room, with his windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Even in this wicked place, being exiled into Babylon, Daniel still made getting into the presence of God a priority. This is where he drew his strength. This is where he drew his wisdom And this is where God aligned Daniel's heart and his vision with his own. And this season, Daniel faced so many trials and challenges, but through each of which God used to bring glory to his own name. And I found that there's kind of two consistent themes in each of these things that Daniel came across. One, Daniel stayed close to God when the challenge came. He knew God. And then two, God moved in power through Daniel to make his own name known. The first of these examples we see is in the story of the fast, right? Right off the bat, we know in this account, we, we've heard it before, we've heard about the Daniel fast, and as we read earlier, Daniel had been brought into the palace, he'd been brought into like the trading academy of the Babylonians, and off the bat, Daniel made a bold decision, right off the bat. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, it says, but Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods, Daniel chose to go against the grain. He stood out. He's like, I'm not going to defile myself with your food. I'm not going to do the things that you're doing. I'm not going to submit to your way because I live a life that honors God. What was their response? We read in verse 10. But he responded, I'm afraid of the Lord my king who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to other youths your age, I'm afraid the king would have me beheaded. They fired straight back, didn't they? That's stupid, man. What are you talking about? You're going to get sick, you're going to get pale, and then my head's going to get cut off and it's going to make me look really bad. So don't do that. But the decision that he made was seen as a threat to the chief of staff, but also to the way of the Babylonians. But Daniel didn't bow down. Daniel stood firm. And then we see in verse 15, it says, at the end of 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. God's way was proved right in this place. God moved in power and bared witness to his own goodness and his own faithfulness through this miraculous act that happened in these young men. The fruit of God was made evident through Daniel. And what allowed Daniel to do this? As we read just before, Daniel knew how to get into the presence of God. What did he do? He prayed and he knelt He spent time with God. He listened to God. He let God align his will. And then he submitted. When you kneel, when when you're praying, you get down on your knees to sign to God, saying, God, uh, let your will be done, not my way but yours. And it doesn't always have to be a physical kneeling, but there's a kneeling that happens in the heart. You see, Daniel was submitted to the will of God. And I know for me in my life, this was something that I struggled with big time. I was so busy in my circumstance being focused on how I wanted to see God move that I couldn't see the opportunity that he was opening right before my eyes. I was praying, God, get me out of here. Or God, get them out of here. <laughs> get one of us out of here. Just do, do something, right? This is not working. But it wasn't until I actually hit rock bottom, a point of desperation. Why is it always this case? Why are we always so stubborn? I wish I was smart like Daniel and it didn't have to be this way. But no, I hit the bottom of the barrel that I finally shut up, <laughs> and I finally listened to him, and I finally said, God, oh, okay, what do, you, what do you want to do? And he shifted something in my heart. I still didn't want to be there, but I recognized that I wasn't going anywhere, and I had a decision that I needed to make. I could stay here complaining with one foot out the door, or I could submit, and I could actually begin to walk in within the plans that God had, not just for me, but for the people that I was working with and the workplace that I was in. So I began to pray, at first just to myself, but then increasingly sort of more obviously. I'd pray, God, give me the strength just to do this for you. Whatever I'm doing, let me do it for you. If I'm fixing this car, 
the stupid car that doesn't work and the parts are wrong and oh, I'm getting frustrated, but don't let me snap. Don't let me be frustrated like these other men because I'm fixing this car for you. When this customer is being rude to me, give me a peace, God, because I'm here for you and I'm being kind to them for you. Not for me, but for you. And this is how God sustained me because he changed my perspective. And when I realized I'm here for him and not for me, it allowed me to keep going. And God began to open the doors for me to be able to minister to the people around me. And this is what I love about Daniel's story is, is he wasn't just a passive player in the game. He wasn't just hanging in there, oh God, I'm going to hang on and wait until this is over and then everything can go back to normal. No, God actively moved through Daniel through spiritual gifts and wisdom and began to use Daniel to transform the landscape of the palace. But it also got Daniel into some pretty rough predicaments. In, a, in a chapter 1, verse 17 of the book of Daniel, it says, God gave these four men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. God gave Daniel wisdom, understanding, and then a prophetic ability to interpret dreams. And there soon came a time where he desperately needed to use that gift, otherwise they were toast. One night, King Nebuchadnezzar, once again, great name, had a disturbing dream which distressed him. He called out to all the wise men and said, guys, magicians, wise men, come in. Tell me what the dream is and interpret it. They couldn't do it, so he was like, fine, you guys die. He just put them to death. This guy was extreme, right? And he was so mad that they couldn't do it that he just went, you know what, enough is enough. Let's kill everyone. Let's even kill Daniel and his friends. They weren't involved in this, but no, everybody dies. <laughs> Daniel heard about what went down and requested time that they could interpret the dream. And I love what happened next. Jumping ahead into chapter 2, verses 17 to 19, it says, Then Daniel went home and told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, what had happened. He urged them to ask the God of heaven to show them his mercy by telling them the secret so that they would not be executed along with the other wise men of Babylon. That night, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. What did they do? They got together. They sought the Lord together. And then they asked him to bring his divine revelation. They gathered. They didn't sit and have a brainstorming session like, okay, well, let's see if we can guess this dream. What can we do? How can we, maybe we can try and sneak out of the palace when no one's looking. No, they came straight to God and said, God, only you can fix this. God, we need your wisdom. God, tell us what to do. Give us the words. Give us the dream. Give us the interpretation. And of course, God is faithful. God is good. And he did. Then Daniel returns to the king, filled with wisdom and revelation from God. He succeeded where all the other magicians and wise men had failed. And he interpreted the dream successfully. So what was the outcome? In verse 46 to 47, it says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar threw himself down before Daniel and worshipped him and commanded his prince people to offer sacrifices and burn sweet incense before him. The king said to Daniel, Truly your God is the greatest of gods, the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries. For you've been able to reveal the secret. Daniel got into the presence of God. Daniel listened to God. Daniel submitted and was empowered to outwork his will. And then God got the glory in the end. And it testified to his name. When the trials come, we need to seek God first and his presence first. We need to open our hearts and our ears to listen to his voice. And when we do... He will show us the way and he will equip us with all that we need. And for me, as, as I began to finally stop being a whinging sook and actually began to press into God as I should have been from the very start, God began to do a work in my prayers. Things began to shift. He, he began to stir my heart. You see, my prayers started off very me-centric. God, help me, bless me, but... So those prayers began to change. He began to challenge me to start praying for, for everybody else. So I did. So I, I began to, to pray for the men in the workshop. I began to pray that God would heal them and soften their hearts. But then God also started to soften my heart as well. And I began to see these men for what they were, which is very hurt, 
very wounded, very sad, broken people who were in desperate need of a saviour. They weren't just grumpy jerks. They were broken people. And out of that, he actually began to build relationship there, and we actually started to become friends. And I began to pray over their lives. I prayed over their relationships, their addictions, their finances. I prayed for peace in the workplace. And I prayed publicly in the workshop too. They knew what I was doing, and they thought it was really, really funny. <laughs> They're like, oh, old mate's off talking to himself again. <laughs> like, I'm just working my car. I'm like, but they knew what I was doing. And it started off as funny. But the thing is, they knew who I was talking to. They knew what I was doing. They knew that I was praying for them. I would actually come up to them and sometimes ask to pray for them. And it was so awkward because they're like, okay, man, you, you do you. And then, you know, when like you pray for someone who doesn't know prayer etiquette and they're like, don't close their eyes and they just stare at you. <laughs> You're like, cool, now I'm locking eyes with this guy as I'm praying with him. Like, ah, yes, God. Uh, (laughs) Amen. (laughs) But it was really funny. But they knew what was going on. You see, they could, God began to soften their hearts to my faith. At the start, it was a joke to them. They were actually maddened by it. But they could see the fruit of my life, and they could see the fruit of their life, and they're like, hang on, something doesn't add up here. Because I'm not that special, right? I'm just a normal guy. And they're like, why? In their lives, there was hurt and pain and bitterness and anger. They could see that in my life, I had a, an amazing wife that I loved. I had friends. I had a good relationship with my family. I had a, a passion in my heart and a joy because I knew that God was calling me into a high purpose in my life. And This spoke to them subconsciously and began to plant seeds. And then God began to speak to me as I finally shut my mouth and opened my ears. And he began to show me opportunities for me to minister to them. He gave me the right questions to ask, the right stories to tell. He brought scripture to my mind. They still thought that God was rubbish, but a connection was being made. A seed was sown because they knew who I served. They knew that I loved Jesus. And they're starting to see the fruit that comes from a life that strives to honor God. None of us are perfect. My life wasn't perfect. But when we seek him with all that we have, there's blessing. And that bears witness. And all of this was setting the stage for what was to come. In the story of Daniel, we see all this build up, all this time. There's Daniel been on a journey and and there were several dreams that he interpreted. And there was all these amazing, powerful things happen. But it came to culmination in this amazing, powerful, miraculous work of the hand of God. So we're going to jump to a few years ahead and... King Darius is now on the throne. Daniel had also gained favor in his eyes, obviously because of the hand of God. He was outperforming all the kings, the administrators, the officers. And Darius had actually planned to put Daniel in leadership over the entire empire. The admins and officers didn't like this. I wouldn't have liked that if I was empty. Who's this bloke? Where's he from? How come he gets to be in charge all of a sudden, right? So they planned to basically throw him under the bus. They convinced the king to make a decree that anybody who prayed to any god or person other than King Darius in the next 30 days would be thrown in a lion's den. And the king signed it. He went, okay, that sounds like a good idea. Because they were his team of consultants. And he's like, yeah, okay. Do you think Daniel stopped praying? Nope. (laughs) He knew that he needed to get into the presence of God, even with this dire consequence placed upon him. He knew the importance of getting to the presence because he knew that that's where his his strength and blessing came from. So, of course, Daniel gets reported to the officials who reminded the king that Daniel then has to be thrown into the den. And this actually greatly greatly distressed King Darius because he had a soft heart for him. In, In Daniel chapter 6, verse 14, it says, Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled, and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. The king didn't want to do it. He's like, oh man, that was a bad idea because he liked Daniel. God had given uh, favorable eyes to Daniel for this king. And he's like, I don't want to do this to this bloke. What's going on? So he spent the whole day trying to figure out what to do. But he could not find a way out because his men who hated Daniel reminded them that according to the law of the Persians, no decree signed by a king could be revoked. No, it takes his backsies. <laughs> so, but it's in essence, essence what it was. And in verse 16, it says, So at last the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. 
But listen to this. The king said to him, May your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. That's such a profound statement. You know God is at work when the the king of the enemy empire is basically rooting for your foreign God to come through for you and save you. The work had already been going. There had already been fruit. There had already been witnessing occurring. And this king, who had just put in this decree, banning people from worshipping other gods, was like, but really, I hope he, I hope he does come through for you, mate. You, you, I, I, we like you here. The groundwork had been laid, and now it was time for the miraculous to come. And we read from verse 19, it says, Very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God, whom you serve so faithfully, able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, Long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight and have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. God came through in the end and moved in a way that only God can. Wasn't Daniel in this case? Yes, Daniel was faithful and Daniel was obedient, but there's not much Daniel could have done in that lion's den. He was in a pit surrounded by ferocious lions who would have been very happy to eat him. He's stuck. There's nothing that he could have done. So when (laughs) <laughs> the miraculous happened, only God could get the glory, and only God could get the crescent, the, the present, the crescent? <laughs> he could get the credit. Because Daniel was obedient, he was submitted, he listened to God, God moved in miraculous power in that circumstance to bring glory to his own name in a way that man never could. And then this is the best bit, I love this bit. I'm going to read it from verse 25, it says, Then King Darius sent this message to the people of every race and nation, and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. He will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. This testimony of God's faithfulness, his goodness, was proclaimed across the entire nation. What started as just a bit of influence happening in the palace was now a decree that had been demanded by a king that had completely changed the landscape of this nation. The kingdom was changed because Daniel was obedient and he gave up his life to God so that God could demonstrate his power, his faithfulness and glory in the most difficult of trials. And that's the best thing about it in the end, isn't it? Because it's God's work. It's God's power. It's God's strength and God's wisdom in the end. Because in that way, when the miraculous happens, he gets all the credit. And over the course of my time in that workshop, it was just under about four years I was in that place before I moved to another automotive joint. And um, I got to witness the hand of God working in the lives of these men. I began to see chains break off and culture shift and where there was a, ho- a hostility and aggression and anger towards God at the start, there became an openness and a curiosity. And the best thing is it happened so gradually that they didn't even know it was happening to them. <laughs> I used to like go home and laugh when this stuff would happen. I'm like, you don't even know what's going on. It was so good. Here's some examples, right? Something small, but thinking back to the music, right? At first... It was deliberate. They'd try and stir me up, right? They'd put on something really gross. And they'd be like, ah, yeah, you don't like that, do you, mate? Yeah. Because they all sound like that, actually. You mate, now. You know what? Yeah, you don't like it when I play that, do you? <laughs> um, can you tell I was practicing that while I was working in that workshop? Yeah. But then it, it went from, ha, ah, yeah, to, oh, yeah, you don't like it when we play that, do you? Yeah, ha, ha. And then it became, hey, this one's pretty bad. Do you want us to turn it off? And then it became, hey, do you think this song is appropriate to play for the workshop? This was the same bloke. 
This wasn't like different people. This was one guy who at the start used to purposely try and gross out me and the customers and went, mm, I don't know, man, that song's a bit risky for the workshop. It's not what we're trying to put out here. <laughs> so funny. I, I watched as they began to soften to each other and to customers and to apprentices. I copped it so bad when I started. That I used to get locked in the tire cage, tools thrown at me, set on fire, just the usual things. But when we had a workplace student come in from high school, and they just turned into teddy bears. And it was the best. And it was so much fun. And there was joy in the workplace. And we had this young bloke who would just hang around the workshop. And it was like they all turned into his uncles. And we would just hang out and laugh. And it was joyful. And I'm like, man, I mean, that would have been nice when I was first there. <laughs> but the thing is, is when the apprentices came down the line, they didn't have to cop it in the same way that I had done. Because God had softened their hearts. God had done a work in them, even though they didn't know it. But he had done it. Because God... Is good. God answers prayer. And the customer service skyrocketed. We used to have a really terrible reputation in this particular workshop, but our customer service got so good, it got to a point where managers in the corporate sector began to send managers from other stores to our shop to learn from us. They began to use us to train people on how to interact with customers. I'm like, if you asked me at the start, I, w- I used to see them getting into screaming matches with customers. One time, they got so mad that a couple of the boys put some car jacks under a customer's car and wheeled it out of the car park when they weren't there and hit it behind some bins. Like, this is how petty it was. And yet now, we were the poster child for the company. And God moved in the lives of these men too, in their personal lives. They began to feel conviction for the way that they were living. And they didn't know why. They, they stopped boasting about it. They stopped bragging about it. And they realized that it was actually not something to be proud of. People who were party animals, over these years, I watched them settle down, build a home, find a part, have kids, build a safe home. And I'm like, I just, you couldn't comprehend them doing that at the start because they were out on the weekends getting up to all signs of nonsense that I'm not going to repeat on a Sunday morning. And something utterly miraculous happened with one of my, my managers. And this is something that just, I still can't believe it because you'll see what I mean. It's crazy, right? So this one manager I had... He was a self-proclaimed alcoholic. He used to roll with bikies back in the day. He was a bikie. Uh, he was into the rave scene, into lots of substances, we'll say. And, um, but yeah, he, he lived this wild lifestyle, partying and, and staying up late, just being an absolute loose cannon. But I remember we came back after New Year's break one time. And um, I had been on holidays and I came back into New Year's. And he came up to me and he was like, you know the funniest thing happened to me over New Year's? And I'm like, oh yeah? What was that, mate? And he said, you know, I went to have a drink for New Year's Eve. And I realized that I hadn't had one in a really long time. And I was like, oh, yeah? I was like, yeah. He goes, I actually sat down and pulled out my calendar and thought back to the last event I had. He goes, I realized that it had been nearly two months since I've had a drink. And I said, really? And he's like, yeah. And this is a guy who used to go through several cases of beer every week. And he's like, you know what the weird thing is? Because New Year's Eve, I sat down. I'm like, well, better pour myself a drink. And he had a drink. And he realized, he's like, I didn't have the taste for it. It's really strange. It's funny, right? He's like, oh, gee, that's weird, isn't it, mate? And I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) mate. (laughs) But the thing is, I knew what was happening. The gears hadn't ticked in his head, right? But God had been doing a work in his life that he didn't even realize because this had been such a vice for him for so long. He would even sometimes rock up to work um, hungover and things like that. And God had just broken this off in his life and he hadn't even realized it. But the thing is, I think he did know it a bit. Because otherwise he wouldn't have come and shared with me, would he? He knew I was praying to that. He knew I was believing with him. He knew, he knew I was encouraging him in this place. And that was just one of the amazing miracles that I saw God do in these men's lives. And the best bit is, once again, I had nothing to do with it. I'm not a counselor. I'm not a a financial advisor. I'm not a life coach or a doctor. I was just able to be there with them in this time, in this chaos. And all I did was make them aware of the presence of God. And then God did the work. God moved in power. God changed their lives. Know him. Get into his presence. Listen to him. Let him do his work in you. And then we make him known. We aren't called to to change the world. But we're called to to carry the power and the presence of the one who has and will. 
And when we actually step in in obedience and actually say, you know what, God, this circumstance, you know, you know where I'm at, God. You know I'm, I'm having a hard time here, but that doesn't matter because it's not about what I want. It's about what you want to do. God, help me see opportunity. God, help me, help me listen to you, have that, hear that quiet voice so I can have that opportunity to minister. But God, I ask that you just equip me to do all that I need to do here. And he will. He will move. He'll bring transformation. I've seen it. And that's why I'm so passionate about it because this story makes no sense in the practical. It only makes sense when there's a good God who loves people. And that's, that's all I really wanted to do this morning. I didn't want to speak for too long, but I just really wanted to encourage you guys in this. And You know, there are a lot of people who are in a, a sort of a Babylon season at the moment. You know, you're, you're kind of displaced you, you turned around, you're like, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know why these things are happening. I don't know why all these things have come across our path and we can't see a way out. But don't make the same mistakes that I did at the start. And actually, let's learn from someone like Daniel where we can learn what to do. But in these times where it's difficult, we need to, to press into him like never before. We need to double down. We need to get into his word. We need to, to, to pray and, and listen to him. But not just at home, not just at church, but out there. Because you see, Daniel got into the presence. It wasn't back with his people. It was in the palace of the enemy. And when we step out into this world, when we step out into these places, we need to actually be filled with boldness and go out and say, you know what? I'm not going to hide this away. I'm not going to run from this. I'm not going to be with one foot out the door. But God, give me the strength to actually come in and do what you want. You can, I love this concept we talk about in practicing the presence. It's the idea of statio. We talked about it a few weeks ago. And it's basically the moment between the moment. It's a fancy word, but basically it means this. We have these crazy, chaotic days and all these busy things happening. But there are gaps and there are pauses. And what we need to do is take advantage of these breaks, these pauses in life, and stop. And stop with our busyness. Stop thinking about all the, the, the craziness of the day, but actually say, you know what, God? Thank you. We take time to, to be grateful. We take time to worship Him in the moment. And even like for me, that was working on cars. I had a lot of time and a lot of free brain space. You know, I was just hit card with hammer. Bang, 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 bang. <laughs> but um, I, would, I begin to pray and I begin to pause and I say, God, let your will be done. God, change my heart. God, fix what's going on in here because obviously it's not working out here. And in these moments, in the moments, God began to do a work in me. Because I, I had to make a decision to, to actually get into his presence. So learn from Daniel. Practice his presence while you're in Babylon. He'll give you strength. He'll stir your heart. He will align your will with his own. And then he will equip you to move in power so that transformation can occur so that his name is lifted high into the world. Know him, make him known. It's that simple. It's that simple. And hey, maybe you're hearing this this morning, and I hope you guys got something out of a, a bit of this morning and something to, to, to go home and, and meditate and, and chew on. And I'm not going to do a big altar call moment because that's, that's not what this is about. What this is about is us fixing our eyes and our awareness on, on what he's calling us to do. But maybe you're hearing this today and you're, you're hearing about the goodness and the faithfulness of God and you're hearing that, oh, he actually does have a plan for you and you want that in your life. You want that blessing. You want that fruit. But you actually don't know him. So we're going to take a moment that we do every week to give everyone an opportunity to, to give their life to the Lord. Because God loves you deeply. He cares for us deeply. He wants us to come to Him and all that we have to do to be able to come to the presence of God is accept the gift that He's given us through His Son, Jesus Christ. We all mess up and fall short of the glory of God. So God sent His Son, Jesus, to earth to die on the cross and take the penalty for all of our shortcomings, sin and shame. And it's a price that you or me can never afford to pay. And all we have to do to accept this freedom is to believe of the work, I believe in the work of Jesus on the cross and accept him into our houses 
hearts as Lord and Saviour. So can we just all just um, bow our heads and close our eyes and just in this space, we're going to take this time because <laughs> to see any of this, to see any of this fruit, to see any of this blessing, it all starts with a decision and we need to open our hearts to follow Jesus. So if that's you in this place and you know that you haven't been living a life that's submitted to God, you know that you've been doing things your own way and you realize that you recognize that there's a need for a savior in your life. Maybe this is the first time or maybe this is something that's a seed has been planted in your heart and you've realized, oh God, I've been doing this wrong. I haven't been listening to you. I haven't been praying. I have, I've been ignoring you and, and my heart has wandered from you with every head bowed and every eye closed. Um, we're gonna, I'm just going to ask you to do something simple. Just uh, In a moment, I just want you to raise your hand and what we're going to do is we're going to pray together as a church. And um, support you as a church family in this amazing decision, the best decision that you'll ever make. So with every head bowed and eye closed, on the count of three, if that's you and you want to accept Jesus into your life as Lord and Savior, why don't you lift up your hand? One, two, three. Yep, I see that hand. Awesome. Awesome. Well, church, why don't, we, we, why don't we pray together? I'm going to pray and then pray after me so we can support the, uh, the person who made this decision. Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for living life on my own. I know that I've fallen short of your mark. But I thank you for the blood of Jesus on the cross. I believe that he died on the cross and that he rose again from the grave, victorious over sin and death, so that we could have a relationship with God. And from this day forward, I make a declaration that I'm going to follow you. Lord, keep me strong and help me follow you. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Let's give them a massive round of applause. Hey, every time one person makes a decision, the kingdom of God goes absolutely mental. So let's give them a great big round of applause. That's fantastic. Awesome. Hey. Awesome. Hi, Leash. Hey, that's all from me this morning. I hope you guys got something out of that. Learn a little bit more about me and my journey, but also learn about how good God is and how good God can work in any circumstance. But hey, before we go out and go into the craziness that is the day of carols, and I'm sure a lot of people have lunch on their mind, I'm going to pray the prayer of blessing. So why don't we all stand? Why don't we lift up our hands and I'm going to pray this and hopefully I don't get the words wrong. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Awesome. Hey, have a wonderful day, church. We will see you, if not at Carol's, then next week.